Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's Spencer Warman again here. I uh, hope you guys have had a nice couple of weeks and uh, everything is um, going about as well as, as we can expect it to be going. Um, today we're going to be doing our session on Envy as an electronic light table, or ELT, for those of you that are more familiar with this. So a lot of you guys know um, Envy as the hyperspectral multispectral tool. Um, but what a lot of folks don't know is that there is a lot of additional functionality that comes packaged with Envy um, for processing other types of data sets, LIDAR, so we can do feature extraction, we can do synthetic aperture radar, we can do um, just a plethora of, of uh, activities or image analysis on uh, using Envy. And we have James online right now. He's going to present to you some uh, use cases for Envy as an ELT. And then he's going to walk you guys through a few um, a few different scenarios, ranging from feature traction with LiDAR to, um, well, I'll let James take it over. All right. Thank you, Spencer. Uh, can everyone see my screen? All right, awesome. Um, so like Spencer said, uh, the goal of today is not to make anyone a Envy expert, but it is really to expose you all to a lot more of the functio functionality uh, that's actually been in Envy for a while. Um, but I think we got so good at doing hyperspectral that people figured that we were only for hyperspectral data. So hopefully by the end of this webinar, you definitely will have a, a deeper understanding of kind of some of the end-to-end -end functionality that Envy provides. Um, we definitely won't cover everything, um, but I hope that um, some of the demos that I'm going to do uh, fingers crossed, I'm going to be doing everything live. Uh, there are a few videos spread throughout the, the presentation, so we'll do a little brief slide presentation first. And because um, my goal is not to necessarily um, kind of allow you all to see this overly prepared stuff, like I want you to see it as you will experience it on your own. Um, we will make uh, the slides and the data sets that I use. A, available um, at the end of the webinar. So you'll be able to um, go onto our website and download the presentation and the data that I used um, as well. So with that, we've gone through introductions. Um, so uh, Spencer introduced himself and again, I am James Lewis. Uh, lead solutions engineer, primarily supporting our defense and intelligence and special operations forces. Um, quick background, active duty Army now, transferring to reserves, been with the company for about six years um, and do a lot of our training and really being the voice of you, our customers, um, as to what you want to see in the software. Um, I definitely will say that a lot of what you're going to see today is based off feedback from the community. Um, so even though we're not going to focus necessarily on hyperspectral, I do want to emphasize that we will continue um, to be the leaders of hyperspectral exploitation. But within that, if you think about multispectral panchromatic, all of those are just subsets of, of hyperspectral data, right? It's just less bands. Um, but again, I think because of people we got so good at doing that, people kind of only thought of us for being that niche tool to do that. So we'll look at what's new in Envy. You'll notice that in all the webinars we do, um, as we release new versions of Envy, um, we're always going to kind of present, take a couple of slides to talk about what's new because at the core, that is really what allows you to kind of see the breadth of what you would be able to do with the tool. I will caveat that by saying that this set of what's new slides are going to go all the way back to about NV 5.2 and up to our current 
version, which is 55.3, because I think there's a lot of things that have been added that people just are not aware of. Again, we won't touch on every single thing, but I picked a couple of key things that I think that the overarching community um, would see the value of specifically as they pertain to utilizing Envy as that, that ELT. We'll talk about what's an ELT, and then you'll see some hands-on demos um, using a couple of different aspects of Envy with a couple of different uh, types of data. So we'll, we'll use uh, some FMV data, we'll use some LiDAR data, uh, we'll do some, some, uh, some of our typical raster, both panchromatic um, and some, some uh, multi-banded data. And then after that, we'll take a couple of minutes on the back end to you know, do a Q&A session uh, for anyone that may have sparked uh, any thoughts. So definitely as we go along through the presentation or the demos, jot down some notes, and at the end of the session, we'll take some time to answer those. So Envy the leader in image science. Um, I think that goes without saying. Uh, we've been around for a really long time, and that's kind of been our bread and butter. Um, but over the years, as more and more um, platforms have come online, different data sets and algorithms to exploit that data have come online, we begin to add those in. And as the future of data exploitation has begun to, uh, with those new data sets being larger, of size, you know, instead of moving those data sets down to a desktop, the future is beginning to offload some of that processing on these servers. So whether that be in the enterprise or in the cloud. And, and Envy has maintained and kind of followed along that, that same path. So uh, even though we won't necessarily demonstrate it here, if you were in our last webinar with the modeler, that was kind of a first step into really distributing how I process data. So I build a cool tool on my desktop, but I process that data out. I have the ability to process that data out all on a server and really only pull across what's important to me, which is the derived product. So there's a lot of challenges uh, facing users that they typically don't necessarily think about using Envy for. So social economic security, so doing things like uh, urban sprawl, food, you know, um, crop health, all of these things that kind of fit in. Because if you look at a lot of countries outside of the U.S., a lot of little skirmishes that then build into wars and civil wars, uh, you know, start over food. So food security, things like that, uh, sustainable development support. A lot of this, uh, again, kind of tapping into that socioeconomic, uh, sustainable development support. Um, you look at deforestation, um, those things, have a lot further reaching consequences than just the, the deforestation. You look at habitat, all of these other things that kind of roll into when those types of things happen. But humanitarian and disaster response, um, using it to do things like damage assessment. We do quite a bit of work with uh, FEMA and kind of helping them streamline some of their processes um, or flood plain mapping um, because you heard Spencer mention that we can exploit SAR. So um, when you're looking at, you know, right after a storm happens and it may be cloudy or hazy, it's gonna be really hard for a typical EO sensor to, to look through that. But we could utilize SAR to be through and still do that. And then of course, you know, supporting our DNI community, you know, on the national security protection and government side, um, doing various things from, uh, detecting chemicals to looking at environmental effects uh, of, 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 of war and different things that, that we can do, um, force security, all of those types of things. And so we get there by kind of having this NV plus IDL. And for some of you, when you think, oh, another ELT, um, what really differ differentiates NV from other ELTs? is that um, in addition to the, the just the ELT itself, which is the common part, right, across these other things, is the power of IDL. So having that standalone scripting language is a really powerful thing that truly separates Envy apart from some of those ELTs, other ELTs, in addition to um, 
the robust integration into the ArcGIS platform. Because what you will see is that even though we have the ability to manipulate vectors within Envy, we're not a GIS tool. We're a raster processing tool. Um, and so over these years, we've we've built and deepened that relationship uh, with Esri to ensure that we can streamline some of those processes. So one of our webinars will be the Envy and Art GIS integration. So we won't focus on it here, but I want to make sure that I preface that to, to say that even though you may not see a lot of robust GIS processing here, we do have a way to to make that a lot more robust. And so within Envy, we kind of have this platform of, of, of Envy and IDL with all of these other things that really enhance that electronic light table functionality. So what, so what is Envy? What is Envy itself? So it's a software for the analysis of hyperspectral, where we, we kind of got our start, but multispectral, which is just a subset of the hyperspectral, panchromatic, right, single band. But we can also do things like LIDAR. I would say that a bulk of the community does not think of Envy as a LIDAR tool. Um, and we have tools here that are now part of some other packages that makes the exploitation, um, building that foundational data uh, from point cloud data, um, very easy and, and, and really useful. But then we can also, have tools for things like SAR, and then you see down there at the bottom vector data. Um, I think you would notice that once I actually bring Envy up and I start pointing out some things, you will see that ultimately what we care about is efficiency. And if I can stay in one platform or maybe even two pieces of software, that makes my life a lot easier. So we've ensured that we've given you at least the basics of being able to manipulate vector data. And then when you need more robust vector manipulation, again, we've made it really easy to call call our processes from ArcGIS. Uh, written in IDL, the beautiful thing about IDL is IDL has a lot of flexibility. It in itself is really powerful, but it has the ability to bridge to things like Python, which we will be having a webinar on. So you could call uh, Python tools. You could wrap C+, Java, all these other types of tools put them within IDL and then plug them into Envy. So if Envy doesn't have a specific piece of functionality, it is really easy to get that functionality in. Now, of course, I use easily, easy loosely. Uh, if you have the skill set to do that, you could get it in. Uh, it's probably a better way of, of quoting that. But our tools and techniques are useful for a variety of disciplines. So whether you're a, a, a strict imagery analyst doing a lot of literal interpretation, which I will demonstrate some ways that an imagery analyst who's doing a lot more of the literal interpretation would be able to utilize uh, Envy. Or you're a spectral scientist who cares more about looking at pixels. Um, we have tools that make that, that, that really easy. And then some of these new things we've added in, I think, again, will um, kind of round out what what Envy is, and again, I want to reemphasize that a lot of what you're going to see is driven by you. And and so um, if you have feedback, if you're an avid user and there are things that you want to see um, myself or Spencer or the points of contact list that I have at the end are always willing to listen and, and, and try our best to get those things out for you. But I, I, I definitely will say that a lot of what you will see in demoed um, is driven by the community. So real quickly, I'll just highlight a couple of modules because some of these you will see um, demo today. So uh, feature extraction has been updated if you haven't used it in a while. So you not only get 2D, but you also get 3D feature extraction. Uh, we have a dim extraction module. We have an atmospheric co correction module outside of the included atmospheric correction module. So I don't want people to think, well, I can't do atmospheric correction without that. You can't do things like flash or quack without that but we have some out of the box atmospheric corrections, empirical line and things as such, dark object subtraction. We have SAR processing tools. So uh, all the way from robust into end SAR processing. So if you're more of a SAR scientist, like you dig deep into this, then we have full blown SARscape. But if you're more of an analyst like myself, we have now a SARscape toolkit 
a version that bolts directly into ArcGIS. So you can call those powerful tools directly in ArcGIS or a version that bolts directly in the Envy. So now you have two different flavors. So from the more experienced to the, hey, I just need to get answers out of my out of my data. Um, for our DNI people who use a lot of NIDA data, a JIT compliant um, NIDA module, right? So it means that, hey, you're writing, writing, reading NIDA, different versions of it. Envy allows you to do that. And probably our, one of our newest module and, and one that um, a lot of is getting a lot of great feedback is our, our release of our deep learning module. Um, so it's really a way to enhance and make deep learning user friendly. So as we look at the capabilities, um, we'll look at some examples of, of the extensibility of Envy because a lot of tools that either you can get from the community. If you're on the DNI side, you can download from the web. Even if you're in the academic space, uh, there's a lot of colleges that are writing plugins to Envy. Uh, you can Google them and they, they pop up all the time. Our ArcGIS integration, again, won't focus on it here, but it is a part of the a key part of the capabilities of Envy, particularly as an ELT on that desktop. Data support. I'm going to show you the robust set of data that we can support. Of course, we won't open all of them, but I think that's a key to being a ELT is uh, can I get my data in? That's step one. Can I even get data in? And then is it easy to use? And so we've done that by enabling workflows. So if you're one of our classic users who likes to turn every knob and click every button, that stuff is still there. But if you're someone who just wants to use the power of Envy, but in a easy to use simple interface, then we have workflows that minimize a lot of the learning curve to learning about Envy, but you still get the rigor of Envy itself. So let's start with looking at kind of what's new so that people kind of get an idea of some of these things we, we will touch on again. This is a small version of kind of what's been new in Envy, but I'm going all the way back to 55.1 and forward to cover some of the key things, again, just in case some people aren't aware of, of some of these things that are here. So we have a GitHub page. I have verified that this page is still up. So if you're able to get out to the open web, we have a page where we've put various tools written by us uh, internally. Um, they weren't necessarily a fit for the core product, but we maybe for little side projects or one off projects, uh, we created little tools that people might find of use. So things like the UAV toolkit. So if you're a UAV pilot and you collect a lot of data and you want to be able to make sure that those bands are properly aligned, hey, am I muted? you are not. Okay. Uh, you're able to um, utilize that. That is free. Uh, as long as you have a, a, a um, GitHub account, you can go in and move those those repositories. A lot of new annotation and display tools, some that I will demo uh, when we get to the actual ELT portion. Uh, I think it's important to note this is because again, a lot of people don't think of doing some of these things within the Envy interface itself. So we can do things like add grid lines, we can add legends, um, scale bars. So you can do, and basically the goal of this webinar is to show that you can do end-to-end -end imagery exploitation uh, with, within Envy. And so we've added these, these new annotation and display tools to enhance that. Things like on the glass, changing the base projection of the view. We've added in uh, new stretching tools so you can stretch your data, make your data look as good as you would like. We've added in a new classification uh, editing tool. So for the longest, people have said, wow, you guys have really good classification algorithms, but it was kind of painful to edit those. So now you can actually lasso pixel, pixels and change those pixels without having to reprocess that entire data set. We've updated our algorithm for our view shed analysis, and we've also added in additional parameters for the view shed analysis. So now, doing able to, to uh, set parameters for maybe you have a set of cameras that you're setting up for some type of force protection, or you're doing retran sites, and you want to be able to show that if I point this in a specific direction and it has a specific, uh, you know, field of view, you now are able to set those versus just a very generic. 365 degree. And again, some of these things have been 
in the software for a while. Um, a new classification framework. So uh, this now gives you the availability to kind of build out basically classification neural networks that you can run on multiple data sets, as long as the data sets are, are similar. Uh, this is available through the API and it is also available through the Envy modeler. We updated the image registration workflow. So before you had our old classic workflow that would pop up and you would get the, the three windows. We've now since made that all into one single interface. Um, so now your screen just splits, you have your anchor image, you have the image that you want to register and you're working in a single interface versus having to deal with all those windows of old classic Envy. And to that point, I will say for those of you that are online that love classic Envy, classic Envy, at, at least at this point, is not going away. Um, however, what I will emphasize is that new functionality will not be going into classic. Uh, classic will just kind of be maintained. So any new uh, algorithms, the only thing actually that classic will be able to take advantage of is data readability. So if we add the capability to read in a new data set, they will be able to do that. But as far as other functionality, will not be going to class. Everything will be going into uh, the single window interface. Dimension dimensionality expansion is a really cool new um, algorithm they have. Um, as you see here, it creates additional bands. So I want to be careful to emphasize that we're not necessarily making data, we're just expanding the within those existing bands. So now if you want to be able to use like WorldView 2 and do things like target detection, you're able to do those things by using that dim dimensionality expansion and adding, ex basically expanding those bands out. And if you look at the image to the uh, right, you can see kind of how it added those additional bands in. So really powerful tool. Um, again, won't be demoed here today, uh, but it is um, in the help and we are building out a tutorial for it. Some other features, you know, the ability to colorize a point cloud versus just looking at it in its intensity or its elevation. Uh, if you have an image over that area, you can now assign an RGB. So not just doing an image drape, but actually assigning an RGB value to each one of those points. So that once you, even if you go in and subset out those, that RGB value will be attached to that actual point. So now you have more visualization options than just looking at, again, in intensity or in um, elevation space. Now, what it does not do because it's in last format, it does not support in hyperspectral, right? So you're not maintaining like the wavelength, you're not attaching a wavelength to that RGB value, um, at least in, in this, this ratio. Uh, the ability to dice rasters up. So we have a large data set, multiple ways from pencil count to a vector shape file. You can dice that up, separate up the work, bring that back together. The ability to create contour lines. Um, it seems simple, <laughs> but again, it's one of those things that people don't typically think you're able to do um, within Envy. Uh, and you can, you can save it out as a vector, you're able to set your contour uh, width. You can save those out and, and use those into other tools. And you'll see from the little movie, it's not a complicated process at all. It'll go here, take a second. And then like in the upper left-hand corner, it's kind of the finished product of uh, what'll happen. Ultimately, it does have to be a dim. Uh, Envy does ship with a set of world data, which I will show you all during the live demo. Again, a lot of people didn't know that was there. And the beautiful part is whether Envy is connected or disconnected, almost all of this functionality is available. So outside of bringing data services, if anything is local on your system, to include our help menu, our help documentation is all self-installed. All of the world data is installed on your local system. Um, so you don't have to have connectivity 
to utilize any of those things. So you see those contour lines finished and they're available. We can turn them to shape files. Another big one, particularly in, you know, kind of helping close that gap of truly seeing Envy as an ELT was improving our annotation capabilities from just how we do alphanumeric annotations all the way into how we actually present those objects in the imagery. So once we've exploited that imagery, how do I now put that imagery into a product or that answer into a product that I can, I can um, deploy out? So one big leap that's only available in 553 is the ability to create these more robust PowerPoint slides. So the most awesome thing they did was they have given the, the ability to leave objects as PowerPoint objects. Um, that's really powerful because now everything just isn't burnt into your image. So as soon as you move something, you know, you use you lose your aspect ratio or you want to quickly update something, you now have the ability to do that. So once you chip it from your Envy into your PowerPoint slot, all of those things are, are elements. So here's a couple of examples. These next couple of slides are just examples of things you're able to do. We give you out of the box a couple of different templates. So one was full screen. This one is the uh, the square. And then this one, they you know did a false color representation of some spectral indices. Stories from above is a cool one I kind of like. Uh, that map is included so when you do it that's kind of the generic one but you can point to other sources for that uh, kind of location map and then we give you the ability to not necessarily import powerpoint templates but you can actually take a powerpoint slide and you have the ability to choose from what your envy display will actually fill those elements in so you can make them text you can make them your display map you can, you know, you can change out your arrow. Your, your, if you're in a, on the, you know, the DNI side, you may have a very specific unit bug um, that you want to show, and you have the ability to choose and pick and choose. And now that is added to your template library. So big leaps and bounds. We'll see a little bit of it in the demo. Um, another thing we've added in 5.5.3. If you ever think about bringing a bunch of images into your screen, normally what you see is a bunch of overlap. Envy now has the ability to kind of on the fly do more of what we call a quick mosaic so that you actually see all of those individual images as a single image. So you could go in here, you could draw on it, you could vector, you could chip it out to the PowerPoint. So instead of having all of that overlap, you actually just see a, a, single, a single image. So really powerful. We still have the seamless mosaic. If you want to do the more rigorous mosaic, this is just really more so for allowing yourself to manipulate your data or exploit your data uh, without, again, seeing all that overlap from having multiple images open within your scene. So what exactly is an ELT? So I went to old, the old Wiki Bible, right, uh, Wikipedia, and uh, looked up. So if we start back at the earliest, because my background a little bit is uh, Cardo, so I spent quite a bit of time, you know, bent over a light table uh, with an engineer scale and, you know, drawing grid lines by hand kind of thing. Uh, it's basically a viewing device that's used to review photographic film. So if you think about, uh, you know, old imagery analysts, you know, bent over a light table and looking at, you know, wet film, um, that's kind of where a light table got start. So then we, if we jump down and say, well, what is an electronic light table? It's basically an application that makes it possible for imagery geospatial analysts to review satellite imageries on a computer instead of looking at physical film or printed photographs. Um, and you can see, all right, so Envy, because Envy is an, is an electronic light table. It's a software that I can load up satellite or airborne imagery in, and, and I can exploit that data. So another one of those things, again, that kind of separates Envy out from a lot of the other ELTs is the ability to quickly get new tools, new algorithm things into Envy. So here are just a couple of examples of custom tasks, but then taking those custom tasks to the next level by then being able to 
share those tools into my GIS platform. So in this case, it is ArcGIS Pro. So I built a cool uh, custom port change detection, and I now want to run that same port detection, but within my Esri suite. Well, I can do that. So I can run it in Envy, or I could run it in, in ArcGIS, or build out this custom HLZ finder. Um, because maybe I have a very specific uh, aircraft or I want very specific criteria that maybe an out of the box HLZ finder does not do. And so again, that is this example was us just kind of taking a couple of non-standard aircraft, putting in some criteria and then you know trying to build out more of this custom one. And again, whether I wanna run it in Envy or I wanna work, I'm doing a lot more GIS work but I need the, that tool from Envy. I just call it from my from my art. So some of the ELT demo you'll see here is getting to data. So the first thing, even process something, you have to be able to get it in. Right. So we'll look at uh, different ways of getting data into Envy. Um, then I have to do something. I have to exploit that data. So things like counting feature, extracting features annotating, um, putting data through a workflow, uh, looking at FMV. Um, so even though it wasn't listed on that main that main list of kind of what is Envy, um, I purposely put it last because really we look more at your archive uh, MPEG type video. So uh, we're not trying to be an FMV analyst tool. We have other tools within the, the, the larger kind of Harris geospatial portfolio to do that. But this is more so from the standpoint of, I can remember sitting in Iraq and uh, people come in and saying, hey, I need imagery from today over this thing. Okay, well, I mean, me, I don't have power to <laughs> just move a satellite, but there was usually always something flying. So had I had this capability then, I could have reached out to the FMV guys and said, hey, can you guys give me a video chip of you know this specific you know span of time and then from that video i'm able to bring it in and create geo-referenced image stills and so i'll show kind of some of that workflow and then creating some products from that so once i exploit it well it means nothing if it's just on my desktop i need to be able to put that into a format or a product that makes sense to an end user so whether that be in in, in powerpoint or doing something like a, a, a GRG. And so after we kind of run through a couple of these different things, um, again, we'll open it up for for some questions. So let me bring up Envy. All right, and so I've kind of preloaded in some data sets and I apologize here, I'm uh, dual screening. WebExing here at the same time. So can everyone um, see my Envy? All right, hopefully. We're good, James. Okay. So the first thing, let's, let's look at this kind of Envy in itself. Um, so I know some of you are thinking, man, that looks a lot like ArcGIS. So if you think about a long time, if you're a long time uh, GIS user, you've probably built up a lot of muscle memory, even though you know a lot of people are moving over to Pro, um, still you don't forget kind of logically where things were. So we tried to kind of simplify the layout, use a layout that was very similar to something that a lot of people have, have used before to really minimize some of that learning curve. So the first thing is going to jump out, man, as the ELT, there's a lot there. Like, how do I, how do I find what I'm looking for, James? I need a specific tool. There's a lot here, right? We have a lot of things um, here. Well, we've made that very easy. <laughs> Let's say I want to do change detection. So we've made it where I can actually just go into the search bar of the toolbox, and you notice that now I have begun to minimize the amount of options that I have to search for. And you say, okay, James, that's nice. I see that I have you know, different types of change detection. 
But what about, I don't want to always have to search for that. Well, you also have the option to create favorites toolboxes. And once you add something to your favorites toolbox, it's there in the toolbox. So let's say um, I want this anomaly detection workflow. I can just click on this star, add it to favorites. And so now it's in that favorites toolbox. I can name that favorites toolbox. So maybe I have a specific set of tools for doing, uh, you know, something. So I can go in here, I can create a new folder. So you know that under my favorites. So now I can actually create like my tools. So now I have a folder that I can add tools that I utilize all the time. Again, I apologize for the lag uh, with the WebEx running. Uh, so you may see a couple of seconds. So I'll make sure I try and slow down. One of the new things that we've added with 553 as well is a lot of times you want to continuously know information about the image that you're dealing with as you're exploiting it. So whether it's pan or multispectral, hyperspectral. So you notice that down here in the lower right hand corner now, we've kind of added this informational window. So it does not appear until you actually load something into the main view of, of Envy here. So now I can quickly glance and see the dimensions. If it had a description, you know, I would be able to see the sensor information. I can check the datum. I can see the pixel size. But then along these three status windows in the bottom, I can just simply right click and I can change things like my security banner or the acquisition time. Or maybe I want to always know the data value of wherever my cursor is. So that now maybe if I'm trying to extract something and I want a specific pixel value, I always know I can just take a quick glance. And so you have three different windows that you're able to utilize for that. Over to the left, we have the layer manager. So this is where anything that you are actively looking at in your main view is going to live. This is also where I have the ability to do things like change RGB bands, order your data. You can drag data and move data around. I can change color tables. You could just quickly view your metadata. You can zoom to layer extent. So a lot of those kind of typical ELT things you can do directly from the layer manager. This is also where you have the ability to do things like turn your overview window off and on. You'll notice here that I can either <clears throat> Move my image around and you'll notice that there's a small red box here that moves. I can grab that and change. So I can actually zoom based from my overview window. I can move around in my image by using that overview window. And then what happens when, hey, as an analyst, hey, I've been here for 12 hours. I'm just ready to get off shift. Um, my relief is going to come in. They're going to jump on a totally different workstation. Why make them recreate the wheel or go over the same exact image that I've already gone over? I have the ability to save off this snail trail. So all that analyst would then have to do is open up this image, but instead of spending time going over the same exact area I've done, they can just upload the snail trail and they will already see the portions of the image that I've gone over. So a lot, lot of flunks, uh, flexibility there. You know that we've since updated the North Apple, gave it a lot more of a, a modern feel. And then along this top bar are kind of some of your typical ELT-based things. Um, so things like transparency, contrast, entry mensuration. So this is kind of our basic mensuration. Uh, as we've tried to again solidify ourselves as as ELT, one thing we've also added the ability to do is also support the mensuration services program. So the exact same mensuration services program that the other ELTs use is the exact same one that Envy is available to use. Um, it does require the DoD plugin, which is free. If you're on certain um, defense program of record um, systems. It should be already installed for you. Um, 
but it's the, ex the exact same one. Um, but this one is just your kind of your basic, your basic mensurations. Uh, ability to do apply varying stretches, uh, get to your histograms, draw ROIs. We'll take a look at this feature counter here. A lot of different annotations that we can do. So everything from automatically creating legends. So the legend tool is pretty cool. So uh, let's say you run a classification. You don't want to manually have to create a legend. So you just click legend tool and it's already going to take those categories. But what we've done now is instead of making it a burned in legend, so the old legend tool that everything was going to burn in, you now have the ability to go in and edit that actual legend. But you can see we can also do things like scale bar, add grid lines. So a lot of a lot of functionality within that annotation bar. Uh, place marks. So basically bookmarks. I want to quickly be able to jump around in an image. So I can go here, zoom out a little bit. This is uh, some Deimos 2 data over Washington, DC, uh, where I live, in here, that one here. And so then if I want to just quickly go back, let's just click on one, you know, it drops back. And I can do things like fly and pan, some of the, again, some of those basic things. Another thing I want to highlight as EOT is starting out with some base data. So you'll notice that NV comes loaded with world, these vector data sets are world coverage. Um, not the like end all be all like, oh, I never have to create vector data again, but an awesome starting point. That's all preloaded for you within Envy itself. We also give you a world coverage uh, shaded relief and a world coverage uh, elevation data set. So in this particular is Gem Ted 2010. I think it's around like 15 meters, I think. Um, if a newer version of that comes out, We'll, we'll upload that. You do have the ability, caveat, say you do have the ability to change that out. So if you have another world, a higher res a world data set, or you have a standalone data set, you do not have to use this. What I'm more so ensuring is that you are aware that if you are doing analysis on an area and you have absolutely no data, rather than start from square one, you can actually pull in this data and just begin to to add uh, to it. And again, world world coverage install does not go out and ping a server. This is all just on your your local Envy. Another thing that a lot of people may not be aware of is our ability to save your views in layers. So if you've ever used ArcMap, they have their map um, documents. So everything you were working on kind of stores in that document container. But while Envy didn't have that, um, and I went and talked to our engineer and said, hey, we have to have a way for people to kind of save everything they're working on versus always having to open up all of those things that they worked on. So what happens is, is let's say I zoom out, I'm going to open another version of this with another band combination, change my bands. And again, I apologize for slight lag here. All right, so it's in a one, two, three. Maybe I want to see it in a three, two, one. Change it, get a second here. And I may have gotten a little finger happy and clicked a few too many times. Going. I don't need that one. Let's do this. Expedite this process here. That's three man image, so it doesn't really matter. All right, so I ah, changed both of them. Let's remove this one. 
So I can do things like right click here. I can display in a portal. So a portal is basically like a way to quickly poke through your image and see a image below it. All right, so here's a portal. So maybe I wanted to apply a different stretch to the image on the bottom. Uh, maybe I'm doing a what I call a, a quick no process change detection. I have two images. Well, I can use a portal to do that and I can make the portal flicker and, and say, I mean, there's no change in this. Um, Get something to happen here. All right, so direction. All right, so again, the bottom image is what we'll present in the portal. Um, That out. So what I want to do, say I want to rotate this image, I rotate it so you'll notice that I've rotated it and I'm done for the day. I want to go home. I don't want to come back. So what I do is I go to views and layers. It's going to create a JSON file. That JSON file will contain everything that I've done. So if I have a mixture of rasters, a different stretch, um, does not apply to anything after it and it does not happen automatically. So uh, let me make sure I caveat by saying that you have to already be done processing or exploiting. But if I had some vectors on here, I had some annotations, I had uh, a DIM or whatever, DSM, or whatever the case may be, I would I would have gone through that. So then, I can get rid of this, I can remove it, I could totally shut down Envy, come back, go in, go to views and layers, you just go to restore, go to my desktop, where I saved it out to, I click on the JSON, it's gonna say, hey, do I wanna close all files, you know that it's saying, you know, restore my views and layers. So it's going to open everything back up exactly the way I had it before I closed it out. So you see that image was rotated back to the same stretch, back to exactly where I had it. And so if I had, a, again, if I had a combination of vectors, all of those would have opened up as well. Um, another thing we've added that I want to emphasize that we're coming up on our time here, is the ability to download web data. So I've already opened that and pulled in some data. This also um, allow you to see kind of what we can do with LiDAR as well. So what the web data browser allows you to do is basically kind of remain in one ecosystem. So, you know, part of get, you know, exploiting the data is getting data in, connecting to data. So if I have data connection, open topography is a open source repository of data. Um, note, they have added uh, USGS 3DIM data. Um, so that's USGS trying to map the entire, you know, Earth with, uh, well, not Earth, but US at least, um, in LiDAR data. Um, if you have an EDU account, you can get access to that. Um, but I went in. I used my normal login. I used their interface. So I didn't use a customized interface that I had to relearn. And I started searching. But what happens is instead of it going to my default Windows download manager, it went into my Envy download manager. And from here, you'll notice that it gives me the option to say, hey, do you want to open in Envy LiDAR? I say yes. 
So what's going to happen is right now it is pre-processing already. So it's it's pre-processing that data set. Um, little status bar is happening over on my other screen. It's going. This is a Christchurch, New Zealand. And here we go. Let me get it where everyone can see it here. And so now I have this LIDAR data. So I have here, I have all the messages. It's successfully open. How many points? How long did it take to load? Um, you know, I can do some basics. I can move around. I can change how I visualize it so I can color by classification. That automatically happens. So without a MV feature extraction license, you are able to view data. It creates the DSM um, and you can do the classification. In addition, to being able to uh, do classification, you must have the Envy feature extraction license, which also gives you the ability to do raster-based feature extraction. So now you kind of get a little bit more for bang for your buck, because uh, before they were two separate licenses, but now it's all kind of under that one. But Envy LiDAR self-installs, it's just in the software, really easy to process data, three tabs, um, I don't think I've used a LiDAR tool that was easier. Um, it is not so much necessarily for um, doing LiDAR analytics as much as it is for doing more of your LiDAR product creation. So DIM, DSM, um, orthophoto based off either RGB values or intensity values, um, creating 3D buildings that you get either as a shape file or as collider models. So a lot of different things. The cool part is you can also change out what coordinate system you use. So sometimes you're working with other people who may want a very specific coordinate system. So you can actually output the products in that. So what we'll use is we'll use a we'll create a DIM, a DSM, grab the buildings. Select those. You have a couple of formats. You can choose how much of your data set you want to prove. Most of the time, the defaults out of the box are good to go. Like it will automatically read the uh, point density and it says like it recommends using like a one meter dim, but I can go all the way down to 50 centimeter. Does not have to be traditional LIDAR, but I can tell you that if you are using photogrammatically derived, either from a drone or from SAR, um, if it's really, really noisy, any piece of software is going to have an issue with that. But if you have some nice filtering tools that can kind of do some of the cleanup and give you a general clean, I've processed non-traditional LiDAR point clouds um, as well. Uh, you have the ability. It is multi-threaded. It will use all of my cores, or I can uncheck this and tell it how many cores I want to use. After that, I click start processing. What happens is it grids itself out, and it goes to work. And so it's creating all of those uh, products. And so all of these little magenta boxes that are jumping around are my cores that are going through and processing that data. Um, this is about a 500 meg data set, but I've used it on Geiger mode data. I mean, really dense thousand points per meter squared data. Um, again, like anything else, I'm not saying that it is um, lightning speed, but it's, it's fairly efficient. And a lot of that depends on your on your resources. So once it gets done, it puts you into QAQC mode. So now I have the ability to go in and edit these buildings. Um, you notice that there's a nice high speed button here that says launch products in Envy. If I were in 32 bit mode, I would also have the ability to push these directly into ArcGIS or I can take a screenshot and chip it over to PowerPoint. And I can do things like filter, uh, with a slider, I have 3D view shed analysis. And I can put range rings and you can mensurate. So a lot, a lot of different things you can do within here. So let's quickly take a look at putting these into Envy. I'm going to start a new instance of Envy just because I don't want to mess up the other instance that I have going because I already have some data loaded. So it's going to build everything and it's going to start an Envy session for me. So we're coming up kind of on the end of that hour. I'll let this finish, it's going. Um, I wanna highlight briefly some of the workflows that are within Envy. 
So in addition to some of the standalone workflows that we have, we also have a couple of analyst friendly workflows called Spear and Thor. So that was really quick. So let me show you all the slide our products coming in here in a second. All right, it's going. So I'm sorry, you guys can't see the magic. It popped up on my uh, second screen here, but as soon as it's finished, I'll drag it over so you can see it. Um, Down, down. All right, so you'll notice here that now I have all of those buildings here as a shape file. So not only do I get uh, the buildings themselves, I get the building footprints. Everything is attributed. So you'll notice that we look just like an ArcGIS attribute table, so I can add, delete fields. But you get all of this metadata that's automatically added. But I think more of that focus is that streamlined process of going out to an online data repository, bringing it into my Envy download manager, and then taking it straight into processing and getting out. So versus minimizing Envy, going into a separate web browser, looking for the data set on my computer, ingesting it into the software and waiting for it to load. I kind of did all that in one streamlined process. So, and that, that works for raster uh, or any of those other uh, data sets. But you kind of get everything in this nice, neat little package and it puts everything in. And I can now begin doing other exploitation on this data set. So let's say I want to do something like Maybe I want to look at the uh, look at the terrain. So bring up this the new topographic shading tool. So I go in here and I grab this dim. Bring it in. So my topographic shading tool pops up. Give it a second here. Again, does not like this WebEx running. <laughs> um, but once that comes in, oh, and it's done. So now from this single interface, I'm able to go in and do things like create my shader relief, play with elevation, change color ramps, all in one interface. So again, it's all about that electronic elect table, manipulating my data all in one interface. And so with that, uh, because we got time, no, I didn't get to touch on everything I wanted to. Uh, there was a lot to show, and I, I tried to figure out what was best to to show. Um, again, the presentation will be made available. Um, we will be accessible to you as well. Bring my slides back up. Are there any questions? We can open it up uh, now for questions. Yeah. Uh couple of James really quickly before I unmute everyone. Um, we got one asking if you could share a case study uh, in the defense sector for image correction and object detection using AI, ML, or deep learning. A, what did it, a case study? Uh, case, yes, if you're uh -huh. familiar with anything. On using object, on doing object detection with ML or, or, or uh, ML? Yes. AI? Yeah, so so we've done quite a few things. Um, I kind of like when uh, people ask those good questions. So while I'm gonna I'm gonna open up another presentation for you. Um, so we've done quite a few things using in the DNI space, uh, specifically looking at ML and and AI. So it really depends on um, what your interests are. So we've done everything from take uh, classifiers that were trained on commercial data 
and then utilized um, more DNI for uh, this being an unclassified uh, briefing and uh, applied that classifier to very similar um, DNI data sets. And we were getting, with very little tweaking, we were getting um, 90, high 90s, I mean like, you know, 95 to 98 percentile uh, accuracy rates. Um, another thing we've done, and I apologize for going through all of these slides, um, we did an example for the UK MOD, where, um, so not this particular one isn't. Um, can everyone, can you see my screen? So this one yep, was a case it. study where we took, uh, and this was something we did internally, but what we wanted to do was see if it was possible to use multiple um, modalities of data and create a network to look for these clandestine airfields. Because we were, me and my colleague were just sitting around, we saw on the news this briefing that uh, the Central America, this army was looking at in South America. And they go out, they crater all these uh, drug uh, airfields. And we found one. We actually went to their briefing and found the coordinates for one. So we had a known one. We had some ground truth. And then what we did was we used multiple sources like Planet, some Digital Globe, EGD data, some Google Earth imagery. We went to the Ecuadorian Geo Portal to bring in some shape files um, to build a, a classifier to apply that to. And here you can kind of see, I mean, we were consistently um, at least 90% percent or, or above so 90 percent for single frames using multi-temporal import inputs we were about 90 uh close to 95 so 94 and a half um and then using some other transforms and and, and things we were still around that 94 uh, percentile another one we've done really quick is this was actually done by our uk team uh, we have a team in the uk uh, monitoring an airport so they had a daily collect. We built a plane classifier. And so every day when that collect came in, it automatically would go through and count all the planes. And then mixing Envy with some open source, they built out a dashboard. And so now someone could just log in daily. And this could be Esri's web outbuilder. Uh, this particular one is uh, Kibana. And uh, what we noticed was that if you look at this one particular day, um, there's a big spike. And then what we did was went out, looked at the news, and there was an air show that day. So you had a higher than normal um, account of, of planes there. And then here we've done a lot of other different things um, from, you know, event detection to LIDAR. Uh, we have something called Argus that does automatic, automatic recognition of objects within video uh, from connected cameras. So a lot has been done in that space in the the email. Only reason we didn't talk about a lot of that uh, is because we are we were trying to show MBS LT. Now we do have the deep learning module that makes it really easy for analysts to build their own classifiers on their desktop. We're going to do a standalone webinar for that. Um, we were going to present that as a training course at GeoInt, but with GeoInt um, being canceled, we will just turn that into an actual uh, webinar. So, lot a lot of case studies, a lot a lot of different things we've done in that space. Any other questions? Yes, James. Um, one quickly on the uh, GitHub is, um, yep. can you talk about some of the features that are in the UAV toolkit? Or are you aware of any of the features on the UAV toolkit? Yeah, so what it does is it, um, matter of fact, I will take you there. <laughs> I'll do you one better. I'll actually take you there. Um, so I didn't write that particular tool, um, but um, my understanding is it helps you align bands. So if you're using something like um, like the MicaSense um, spectral sensor for drones, um, it will help you properly align the bands so that you can, of course, for the run. So it's kind of like a pre-processing um, tool that you can then utilize. Uh, there's all kind of little tools there. Let me find the right slide here. Okay, there we go. 
this up, get it. Uh, it is still live. So I verified to make sure. Uh, we'll go to it here. See, I was in there. So yeah, so it's collections of tasks for processing uh, multi-sensor, multi-spectral UAV imagery. So again, started really with the MicroSense uh, sensor. Um, there's different tasks, band selectors, some MVPI art things, uh, MVPI engine, uh, a, a different tile iterator, a planet catalog. Um, so if there's ideas, if there's things, so I talked to uh, the person that kind of admin this, so a gentleman um, uh, that works with us out in Colorado, Zach Norman. And so if there's things that you are interested in or things that may not be updated, please let us know. Um, I confirmed that with him um, and we can get things there. We are trying to stand up a more robust one. Um, Again, just because of nature, you know, things being ITAR and, and things like that, um, that's kind of going through a process. But in the interim, you can go here. We do have our code contrib site on our Nipper page um, where there's free code there. And then if you're on the DNI space, if you go to either Zipper or JWix, we do have pages on Intellipedia that have a lot of different GOTS uh, plugins there as well. Any other questions? Um, one more, James. Uh, okay. And apologies on this one. I'm not sure. I'm, I'm not sure. Um, if an if an end user has crop signature as point data, can NV Crop Science differentiate the crops in agri-domain for identification of wheat or rice? Oh, um, so the crop science tool is more about um that's a good one we may have to get back to you on that um so speaking on that um real quick you know thank you all for for dialing in i'm going to bring up the contact info um that one i'm not sure on i don't utilize the crop science tool um that much and my only use for it was actually literally counting some crops um i haven't used it to really differentiate um the beautiful part is if you caught the last webinar, which is about the modeler, uh, if it is a task, which I think I'm pretty sure it is, you could pre-process data, um, create that. You could use the deep learning module now that that is available. 1.1 um, .1 is multi-feature. So you could utilize the deep learning module uh, to actually go in and you don't have to worry as much about that spectrum. I mean, you do your you know, you do your general uh, pre-processing how you want the data to look before you create your classifier. But outside of that, you could use the deep learning module to uh, differentiate those things and extract those things. Um, here are the key points of contact for all of the DNI. If anyone on the phone is not necessarily DNI, but more uh, academic or Department of Interior or like Department of Homeland, um, we can get you out the appropriate account manager. So don't be afraid to shoot us an email. Um, I just wanted to make sure that everyone has like their appropriate um, account manager. So Mr. Hildebrandt is kind of the overall manager for defense and intel, handles a lot more Army. Spencer, who you heard do the introduction, is NGA US government customers. Uh, Fabio Fargus handles our Navy, Marine Corps and special operations. And then from a technical perspective, um, it's myself, James Lewis, I sit here in DC, and our newest member, um, Tim Mack, sits down at Fort Bragg. He's also a little more dual-headed as kind of an account manager. So if you're kind of in that Bragg area and you want a local kind of account manager to reach out to, um, Tim Mack is kind of your like localized uh, sitting person. But again, you could reach out to anyone on this list uh, if you guys have any questions. Any other questions? And again, I will make sure that those data sets and the presentations, um, I didn't get to change detection and things like that, but I will make those data sets available in the download for you all as well to include um, that Christchurch point cloud data set uh, that I utilized. Any other questions? 
Um, we're getting a few uh, regarding deep learning. Um, okay. For those that are asking about deep learning, um, can, would you please uh, reach out to James or myself uh, offline? Um, we do plan on, like James was saying earlier, we are planning to uh, present a geo, or rather a deep learning um, webinar similar to this one. Uh, we were planning to do that at GeoInt this year, but like James was saying, uh, GeoInt was unfortunately canceled. Um, so that will be, James, do you have a date for that one when you're planning on posting uh, that one? Do not, uh, but we will make okay. sure that just like these other ones, um, it gets out. Yeah. Okay, and then um, thank you, Fabio, for pointing this out. We do have a deep learning webinar uh, from our product manager product management side, uh, Zach Norman, will be hosting that on May the 12th. Um, you can find the link for that on our on our corporate website, Harris Geospatial Solutions. Um, looks like... So with that, um, again, if you guys have do have specific more, more specific questions, please feel free to uh, reach out to any of the folks listed on that contact page. If you are in the commercial space, um, feel free to reach out to us and we will put you in touch with the proper uh, account manager for, um, for your specific applications. Um, I hope we all learned a little bit more about what Envy can do for you as an ELT. Um, we are, we cannot emphasize this enough, we are more than a spectral tool. And we are excited um, that a lot of you are, are learning more about Envy as, as we improve functionality and add features to it. So with that, uh, I will say uh, everyone take care and have a good day.